um, that'll be in July. But tonight we are joined by Mike Dickey, the site administrator for Arrow Rock State Historic Site. Um, we're in his, in his dining room right now um, in this beautiful old uh, 1850s house in Arrow Rock. Um, and uh, Mike is gonna share a little bit of the history of the Missouri Indians, which our state and our river is named after. Um, and some of uh, really the, the long kind of missing history that uh, he's managed to, to uncover working with the Missouri tribe today um, and sort of digging up some of the, the old lost history and also learning a lot from them and sharing it with us. So it's actually a super unique opportunity to get a window into a part of our world um, that we don't often get to learn about. So um, I am really excited uh, to be joined by Mike here and we're gonna go straight to his presentation and see how this works. And Mike, let's go. <clears throat> situated here okay well thank you steve for uh that nice introduction uh this is the first kind of a zoom uh presentation that i've ever given so we're just going to kind of be informal and uh talk our way through and uh let me say, first of all, uh, because inevitably I get this question if I don't give this disclaimer, I am uh, not a Native American by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I don't claim to be. I've just been a person that's been interested in uh, Native American history and culture for most of my life and, and have a number of friends in uh, the Oto, Missouri tribe and uh, the Osage tribe in a uh, nation in particular. And whatever I say, um, it is not my intent to mischaracterize, misrepresent, or malign the Missourias or any other of the native people that I speak about in this presentation. And the first thing you see here is the cover of uh, my book that I did, People of the River's Mouth in Search of the Missouri Indians, it was the first publication ever exclusively devoted to these uh, people. Uh, there just is not a lot written about them in, in uh, the historical record and uh, because they lost their independence at a very early date, <clears throat> they were not involved in any epic battles with the U.S. Cavalry, the way the Lakota and the Apaches and the Cheyennes were. So, so they kind of got overlooked in history from that standpoint. And I always felt like there's something wrong because here's people that the longest river in North America is named after, our state's named after, and yet you don't find any information at all about them. So I tried to fill in the gaps as much as I was able. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. That is a wet cough, by the way. Uh, this is a, a map that shows the location of uh, tribes in the Midwest in the very early uh, uh, period of European contact, late 1600s, early 1700s. And the folks here highlighted in red, the Ho-Chunk, who were also known as Winnebago, the Iowa, the Oto, Missouri, by their own tribal tradition, say they were one people at one time living up here around Green Bay, Wisconsin. Then sometime before 1500 or so, uh, they began branching out and breaking off into political entities. And the Missouri ended up down here on the Missouri River, uh, the Iowa, or Iowa in central and northern Iowa and the Oto over uh, towards the mouth of the Platte River, just, just across from Missouri and Iowa. And those people spoke a language called Shuari, or it's a dialect of the Siouan language called Shuari. And then these in the darker lettering were the Dahegan. 
Siouan uh, dialect. They were the Osage, the Quapaw, the Kansa, Omaha. And according to their tradition, they were at one time one people, and they were over here in the Mississippi, St. Louis area. The Quapaw, whoops, went off downstream. They became known as the downstream people. The Osage went up the Missouri, settled on the river name for them. The Kansa or Ka broke off from the Osage and established themselves in what's now Northeast Kansas. The Omaha and the Ponca, the Omaha, Omaha upstream and the Ponca, they went further on up into Nebraska. And we call these people, their cultural group, uh, the Prairie Cultural Group, they, because they have elements of the Great Plains tribes culture and the Eastern Woodland cultures. And they bear some uh, broad similarities. Now they have very unique traditions and customs that they would have readily recognized. But to the average European, uh, their lifestyle appeared very, very similar. And we also call them the Southern Siouans because the Northern Sioux, the Lakota, the uh, Nakota, Dakota up here were the Northern Sioux. Okay. Uh, the Missouri is sh show up very early on maps. This one is from 1732, Carte de Louisiane by Jean Baptiste de Anville in 1732. And here you can see this little hill symbol. This is the Pierre of Fletch, Arrow Rock, where I'm talking to, to you from right now. And about 20 miles to our Northwest is the Petite Osages, or the Little Osage, which is one branch of the Osage tribe. And just a short distance from them of a couple of miles towards the river was the village of the Missouris or the Missourias. And of course, French Fort Fort de Orleans was just across the river uh, from those two forts from about 1724 to 1728. Uh, and that was the first uh, European establishment this far west of the Mississippi River. Uh, there's not a lot of famous Missourias. I mean, certainly, you know, you could say Crazy Horse, Geronimo, uh, Sitting Bull. Uh, and folks generally know who they are. Well, we don't have any historical record of any Missourias that made that kind of impression, except for this lady. Uh, her name was Sacred Woman. Uh, the French called her the Missouri Princess. Um, she was married to explorer Bergmont, who uh, actually made the first very accurate maps of the Missouri River uh, from its mouth up to the mouth of the Platte River in Nebraska. And he took this woman for a common law wife, had a son by her, took him to France. She was a smash hit in the uh, French court, showered with gifts and uh, uh, generally quite a sensation uh, with uh, the royal courtesans. So she's probably the most famous Missouri, and this is a lunette uh, down in the Missouri capital that was painted to show her arrival back home after her trip uh, to France. And there's been quite a bit written about her, although actually we know very little, uh, but a good deal of it was romanticized tales. The Victorians were enraptured by that idea of, of uh, her coming back dressed in European garb and so forth. Uh, this is a group portrait by the uh, Swiss artist Carl Bodmer who traveled up the Missouri River in 1834. And this is a Missouri Indian brave. His name is Mahankacha, maker of knives. Um, this is an Oto man and this was the chief of the Poncas named Smoke at that time. And just a nice little group portrait that you can see uh, the hairstyles that they had, the, the type of earrings and pendants that they wore uh, in their earlobes, just a nice uh, little picture. And one of the best 
uh, illustrations that we have of an early Missouri uh, man. Now, where did the name Missouri come from? Well, um, when uh, <clears throat> the French, when Mar Marquette and Joliet were coming down the Mississippi River in 1673, uh, they had with them several guides. Uh, you got to understand one thing about, we talk about European explorers going out. These, these people were not exactly uh, uh, breaking unknown ground. They always had Indian guides with them and they don't always acknowledge that. And their guides knew exactly where they were, where they were going, what was around the next bend of the river, who was the next people that they were likely to encounter. So anyway, as they passed the mouth of the Missouri uh, River, Marquette writes this uh, uh, very alarming report about the discharge of whole trees and great quantities of muddy water and turbulence into the Mississippi. But he asks his Peoria Indian guides what people live up the, the river, and they reply, uh, Misere, or Misere. Uh, and the French wrote it as Oui Misere, which from Algonquin to French would roughly translate as people of canoe, specifically wood canoe. Of course, a wood dugout wood canoe is the only thing that you could operate on the river because of all the snags, all the um, uh, uh, sawyers and so forth that were in the river at, at this time. Whereas out on the Mississippi and north of the Missouri River, uh, bark canoes were very common. Uh, their actual name for themselves, and of course, Umezure became corrupted and anglicized into Missouri. Uh, their name for themselves in the Shuari dialect was Niatache, meaning people of the river's mouth. Ni Ni means water. Uh, uta means comes together and chi means a place that you live or home. So that's, that's kind of a literal transa uh, uh, translation of their name. And I was told by somebody that uh, uh, is rather fluent in Oda language um, that he said, you got to understand our language does not translate easily into English. He said, because our language is a picture language. They are painting pictures with it rather than defining uh, phrases. Uh, this is a picture uh, on the Missouri River by George Catlin in 1832, and he shows a couple of these nice big dugout canoes that would be operating on the river. And, and these folks in this canoe could very well be uh, Missouri's or Oto's. Um, now, where the Missourians lived, once they left uh, Wisconsin and moved down to this area, they are called the, the people of the river's mouth. And it's because they settled in the vicinity of where the Grand River meets the Missouri River. And of course, all this area appears the, the Grand River alluvial plain. Uh, these check marks show archaeological sites that are known to us that have connections with Aniota culture. Aniota is the culture that immediately preceded uh, contact with Europeans. In other words, the Aniota is what we call the pre contact or prehistoric uh, Missouri people, as well as the Iowas and the Otos. And uh, these show their sites. This over here, Dalton, William Clark wrote in 1804 that there was once a large village of Missouri's over here by Dalton. And everybody thought, well, Clark was backwards. He meant over here at the Oot site, which is now in Van Meter State Park. Uh, but in 2009, the National Park Service conducted a survey here, and lo and behold, they found indications of an ancient uh, or very old uh, Indian village. And of course, we never were able uh, to uh, finish the examination of that, but there's indications that Clark may be right. But you see, there was a, a big cluster of activity here 
in central Missouri from about 1350 to around 1790 AD of the Aniota, the ancestors of the Missourias. Now, there was not a tremendous amount of written information about the Missourias because as I, as I said, for reasons I'll point out, they lost their independence at a very early date, actually before American uh, uh, acquisition and occupation of Louisiana territory. So how do we learn about people? Well, we learn a lot through archeology span and these women here are digging what is known as a food cache. It was a pit inside of a lodge or house and they stored food in it, dried food. Well, if those pits became contaminated or spoiled, they became trash pits. And you can learn a lot about how people live by looking at their trash. And uh, the, these uh, caches are, were very, very rich in information to show how the Missourias lived, what type of foods they were eating, what kind of pottery they were making, um, and so forth. And these are some things that were excavated and found at the Missouri uh, sites. And they apparently were getting uh, trade, copper, uh, Jesuit rings, thimbles, wire, uh, things like this at a very early age, probably even by the 1680s or 90s. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that was found up at the Oud site there in Van Meter State Park about 1935 was this tablet. It was made out of catlinite. And catlinite is almost universally across the continent recognized as sacred material uh, by all Native American tribes. And it was made into a lot of pipe bowls and uh, uh, sacred emblems. And this tablet was about nine and a half inches long by six and a half inches wide. And on both sides, there were cut marks, but there were also scratching of these symbols. And uh, these symbols have been colorized so that you could see what some of the different designs on them were. And, and we actually believe that this was a uh, uh, with the scratch marks on it that this was used for cutting sacred tobacco for ceremonies. And on this side, you see here a woodpecker. This is a woodpecker. And he has around his eye what is called an eye surround. And I'll show you this. And he has a uh, uh, what we interpret to be a speech symbol. So this woodpecker is a messenger, being a bird, it's from the sky, the upper world. And then over here, we have these odd looking uh, shaped M figures. And we believe that those represent uh, the, the lower world, the underworld. So the sky and the lower world, and this is, um, one of the constellations and my name went right out of my head. And do uh, you have something there, Steve? I do, let me give you a chance. Okay, okay. Um, Cassiopeia, that's it. This, this is Cassiopeia. And Cassiopeia appears in the night sky in the dead of the winter solstice. And that would have marked a time of, of uh, death, the end of life, you know, because of the winter and so forth. Well, there's also these uh, uh, symbols around here uh, that we call the eye surround. And what we think this is, it's a representation of the struggle between the upper world, the sky, and the lower world, uh, the earth. Here's some of those symbols broken out a little clearer. The arrows, the symbol of Cassiopeia, the um, uh, eye surround. There's also a hawk in there. Um, I didn't find him for you real good, but that hawk is in there. He also has that speech symbol. Uh, this is a Mississippian gorget. Uh, the Mississippian culture, these were, were the folks that were the mound builders that built Cahokia and Illinois and 
a lot of the mounds that were in St. Louis known as Mound City. And you notice one of the designs here on that Oots tablet is this mace, which is almost identical to what this uh, Mississippian warrior is holding. You also see this Mississippian warrior has the eye surround the, uh, uh, here, and you see it here on this, this falcon. So there's a lot of symbolism that you can trace back 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years in some cases, and you're finding that still being used uh, in historic uh, times, in, in, in times of interaction with Europeans. And so clearly some of these symbols and traditions are being handed down. And here's where the eye surround comes from. It comes from the falcon, and the falcon basically is seen as a messenger uh, of Wakanta, Wakanta being the creator, the, the being that brought the universe into existence. So you can see that this probably represents a falcon carrying a, a, a message for, for a sacred ceremony. And remember, I showed you the picture of the woodpecker. Uh, this is another Mississippian gorget. Uh, and these are ivory billed woodpeckers. And that's probably what was on the other design. Uh, this is an emblem representing the sun, the give, giver of life, and the four cardinal directions, uh, east, west, and south. And you find that symbolism uh, still being utilized by a lot of Native American tribes today. And here's the ivory-billed woodpecker. Um, one would suppose that probably the early range of ivory bills were a lot more extensive in this very early period of time than they were even uh, by the 1800s, early 1800s. And here's some of that symbolism in use. This is Shunga P. Good Horse, who is also known as Big Kansas. He was painted by Charles Bird King in 1821. He was a very important chief of the Oto and Missouri. He's carrying a war club which I liken to the mace. He has an upright feather, which is a war honor, which is very similar to this one from the Oots tablet. Here's that woodpecker, that ivory bill. And these odd looking green things are the mandibles of ivory billed woodpeckers. So that was incorporated uh, into their um, uh, ceremonial dress. And again, you saw how the Mississippians used that. Well, this is just carrying on through. So I'm not saying that the Missouri were necessarily direct descendants of the Mississippians, but uh, uh, these cultural ideas were evidently being passed around a, a lot and carried on through up into uh, more recent times. And here we have Shingawasa. He is uh, an Osage from 1804. And the Osage being neighbors of and uh, frequently allies of the Missouri, uh, we think that they would have shared some similar customs. They would have had their own unique things. But again, that broad idea that there were broad similarities between these people. And here again is the uh, Falcons off of the Oots tablet. This is a mummified falcon's head that he is wearing in his headdress. There's the ivory bill woodpecker. And there again are the mandibles of the ivory bill woodpecker. And I have seen Osage headdresses that are probably over 200 to 250 years old that actually have those uh, mandibles on them like that. And they were colored. Uh, they were colored green with uh, copper uh, to represent uh, uh, peace or everlasting life. Uh, spirituality pervaded all aspects of Missouri uh, life. This uh, woman is painting a uh, red line down the part of her daughter. This would represent the path of the sun, and the sun was the giver of life. 
And the sun rose in the east, which was the beginning of life. It set in the west, which was the end or death. And this was a reminder that everybody was going to travel that path of, of life and ultimately to death. And this was sort of a way to, to, to remain humble in the sight of Wakanda. Uh, and remember that you were uh, just uh, borrowing time here on the earth, so to speak. Uh, this is the types of housing that the Missourias would have had. Uh, there's no pictures per se of Missouri lodges or houses, but uh, we know from archeological excavations what the house patterns were, what the materials were. We know how the Osages, the Iowas, the Odos and the Kaz, Kansas all built their houses. And so, so it's only logical to assume that the Missouri is, we're following the same pattern. And this is an Iowa wigwam, uh, Shakirathon, house tied together. And you have that framework like you do here in the Osage Lodge, Shizu Hegre, uh, of willow saplings bent over, and then they are overlaid with slabs of bark uh, mat reeds, sometimes possibly animal hides. And they also made the Nahachi, the bark house, which basically was a gabled uh, roof over a, a square uh, structure. So we know that they use both of these types of houses. It's possible when they ventured out into the uh, uh, plains and that they may have used a uh, modest form of teepee. We know they did later in the 19th century. Before that, I have not been able to find anything on that. <clears throat> of course, they utilized everything their environment had to offer. Uh, the women gathered uh, nuts, uh, wild berries, tubers of all kinds. And of course, they grew uh, squash of all kinds, beans, and corn of all times. So they were what we call semi-sedentary people. They uh, uh, did, the women did extensive gardening, but it supplemented hunting and gathering. It did not replace hunting or uh, uh, gathering. Now, when you talk about uh, Native Americans, um, a lot of people this is the image that comes to their mind. Uh, Indians on horseback chasing down buffalo. Well, that was uh, true for only a few tribes, but in the case of the Missouri, it was absolutely true. Um, Henry Tonte in 1684 wrote that the Missouri River is well peopled. There are even villages of savages which use horses to go to war and carry away the carcasses of the cattle, which they kill. So we know the Missourias were on ho horseback or at least starting to get horses and hunt bison on horseback in 1684. We also find Tonti saying along this river, meaning the Missouri and inland are several nations such as the Iowa, Oto and Missouri where the buffaloes, which are found everywhere in Louisiana, come from. The Indians have no other fuel than the dung of these animals. And I find it interesting that he says that. And then in 1719, Jean-Claude Tisnay, the first person to, to uh, reach, uh, visit the Osage, said the little Osage stay in the village like the Missourites, one of the many names for Missouri and pass the winter in chasing the buffalo, which are very abundant in these parts. Horses which they steal from the Pawnees can be brought of them. So it, what, as I was researching about the Missouri, as I came to the conclusion that bison were previously more common in our area than was believed. And I found this map from 1755. It's called the Mitchell map. Here's the Moinguina River, which is the Des Moines River. Here's the Rio Grande or the Grand River. And over here, uh, basically the, the Little Platte River. 
and he has this area identified as extensive meadow full of buffaloes. I think that the Missouris and uh, the Little Osage actually followed the Grand River up into the buffalo country to go hunting. At least that's my, my theory. And here's a map from 1795. Similar thing, extensive meadow full of buffalo, elks, and deers uh, here up at the headwaters of the Grand River, North Missouri, and again down here, Fort Orleans, the old Fort Orleans, and so forth. So again, and and we also uh, uh, archaeologists have uh, found about 20 bison jumps in central Missouri. This is where bison were run over a cliff and then killed. Just like the very famous bison jump that's out in Montana, there's at least 20, not as large as the Montana one, but there's at least 20 of these have been identified in Missouri. So basically, uh, you know, and, and for Tonti to say these people are using the uh, dung of bison for fuel, that, this is all telling me that there were a lot more bison here than we previously imagined that there were. Uh, the Missouri women, you, you, it's hard to get enough good information about the men. It's even harder about the women. Of course, uh, when Europeans are recording things, they're only recording things that are of interest to them, like how many warriors do they have? Can, are they a threat to us? Are they an ally to us? How many furs can they produce? Well, the Missouri uh, initially started out as very important uh, trade partners to the French in, in the fur trade. And the women, in a lot of ways, were the backbone of that because they prepared all the hides, dressed all the hides, prepared them for uh, uh, trade. And they put these in packs that weighed over 100 pounds apiece. And these women would pack these furs to the trade rendezvous, wherever it, it was, whether it was uh, eventually St. Louis or elsewhere on the river. So they're kind of the unsung heroes of the, of the fur trade with Europeans. Um, European trade goods were adapted to fit into Missouri culture. Uh, the Missouri and most of the natives accepted these trade goods. Uh, without accepting European culture. Now these are glass beads that they were not a necklace. They were all found loose. They were just strung together uh, to make a pattern. But this is the uh, base of a uh, ceramic cup and it was filed down and had holes drilled in it, made into a gorget, a gorget which you would wear around the neck. Uh, this is a mural at uh, Annie and Abel Van Meter State Park, uh, which is the, the site of the Oots uh, archaeological site. And this is kind of a representation of how the edge of that Missouri village may have looked uh, about 1673 when they were first recorded by Europeans as uh, Missouri. And then over here, you have kind of a, an interesting shape and it's an earthworks that's been designated the old fort, but it doesn't appear apparently have anything to do uh, with military protection. Uh, without going into it, I, we think that there was ceremonial use because there's certain features in here that align with certain physical features on the ground and um, with certain constellations and stars at certain times of the year. So I think basically it was, it was like a celestial observatory in a ceremonial area. And one of the things I wanna get across while I'm thinking about that is for people to understand how much more sophisticated Native Americans were. Europeans were calling them savages, of course, but they were very sophisticated, complex beliefs, and they mulled over things like uh, life after death and, and what's going on out in the cosmos, and their culture reflected uh, those, those values. And in 1804, William Clark 
describe the Missouri. They passed this village site. And of course, it's been long abandoned. But he said they were once the most numerous nation in this part of the continent. Then in 1693, there are French traders in the uh, Illinois country at the Jesuit missions, and they anticipated great profits that would derive from trade with the Missouris as they were a numerous nation. And in 1700, Louisiana Territorial Governor Pierre Moyne d'Iberville estimated there were 1,500 families of Missouri. Well, now this kind of is difficult to translate because you see the size of these lodges. And if each family had a lodge, you could have an extended family in there everywhere from five to 15 people. Uh, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody all lived together. So 1,500 families, depending on what kind of a measure you use, uh, I've come up with anywhere from about 6,000 to 12,000 people or more of Missouri is in 1,700. And, and that's a good size uh, uh, number of people for that time period. And then what happens? In 1702, Father Mark Berger at the Tamora Mission in Illinois says, the Missouris are reduced to nothing. Well, we had a population of 6,000 to 12,000 in 1700. And by 1780, probably less than 800. And by 1804, 400 or less Missouri has remained. Well, they were hit by smallpox, measles, influenza. They were hit obviously early, at least by 1702. And also they were involved in warfare and, and uh, that reduced their numbers as well. And this is a native rendering of a smallpox victim. Of course, they had no immunity. Uh, and even though those diseases were deadly to Europeans, uh, Europeans had a degree of herd immunity, if I can use that word now, uh, whereas Native Americans did not. And we, we actually think that once Europeans set foot on the continent and the diseases got out, we probably reduced 75 to 85 percent of the native population in this country so that when European explorers uh, or an American settlers came west further, what they were seeing were the remnants of the, the civilizations that had died out earlier. Um, the Missourias in 1764, uh, Max St. Laclede and Auguste Chateau uh, started to work to establish uh, St. Louis and the entire Missouri tribe showed up in camp there and decided that they wanted to settle there. And Auguste Chateau put the women and children to work digging the foundations of uh, Laclede's house and, and a trading facility. And he actually paid them uh, uh, with vermilion and awls and uh, blankets and several other things to do that work for him. So one can say that the Missourias literally laid the foundations of St. Louis. Well, Laclede got back and he did not want the Missourias living there. Uh, for one thing, they were afraid that if the Missourias enemies came into town and a battle started, then, then the settlement would be caught in the crossfire. Uh, also, the uh, Indians expected to be treated hospitably so that if they came to your house, you had to feed them. If they uh, saw something that they liked, you should give it to them as a gift. And it's because they did the same thing. If you went to their village, they were gonna feed you. They were gonna treat you like royalty. And if you admired a horse, you were gonna leave the village with the horse. They were very, very hospitable people that way. <clears throat> now, the end of the Missouri is, is an independent nation. So I told you about how their population uh, declined. 
Well, they got into a protracted war with the Sac and Fox tribe uh, from Northern Illinois. The uh, uh, Sac and the Fox, uh, or the, actually the Fox Indians in 1720 besieged Fort Pontchartrain, which is where Detroit is now. Uh, the French, to relieve the siege, contacted their Indian allies, which included the Osage and the Missourias, to come to their aid. And the, the entire Missouri tribe and the Osages, uh, along with numerous other tribes, showed up and broke the siege, and the Fox were nearly exterminated. The remnants of the Fox took shelter with their close relatives, the, the Sock. And uh, this ignited a bitter feud between the Missourias and the Fox, which also extended to the, to the Sauk Indians. And this warfare went on between the two. And basically they were contesting uh, over the hunting grounds of Northern Missouri. Well, the, the Missourias were getting the short end of the stick in the warfare. And then around 1792, they were ambushed on the Missouri River and nearly exterminated. And we don't have any account actually from that time. Several accounts are mentioned several years after this happens. And this, by the way, is, is not, this is just representation of uh, warfare and canoes, but it's not specifically the Missourias. But um, here's the most graphic account that we have of what happened. And it was recorded by Maximilian, Prince of uh, V, Germany in 1833. He said, we were at the park called Fox Prairie, the Sake and Fox Indians and perhaps other nations formerly attacked and nearly extirpated the tribe of the Missouris. The Missouris came down the river in many canoes and their enemies concealed themselves in the willow thickets. After the Missouris who suspected no evil had been killed or wounded with arrows, the victors leaped into the water and finished their bloody work with clubs and knives. Very few of the Missouris escaped. And I want you to look one more time at that club. That's the type of a club that would have been used. <clears throat> Well, that brought the Missouri to an end as an independent nation. Um, they were uh, dispirited, divided. Uh, they didn't know what to do. About 30 of the surviving families of Missouri went up to Nebraska and joined the Oto. About 20 families joined their allies, the Little Osage. Four or five families went um, to the uh, uh, Kansas River and joined with the cause. And I do find reference once in a while to some Missourias that uh, joining with the Iowas, but I'm not sure what. So, so basically they were scattered. However, it's, it's interesting to note that despite that happening, they still maintained their clan affiliation and they still had chiefs even within their host tribes. So they, they tried to uh, maintain a degree of semi-autonomy uh, within the host tribes that they went to. And here's a portrait gallery of the Nutachi. Uh, when I started researching my book, uh, I was told that there were only two illustrations of Missouri as in existence. And of course, as I got to researching and dug around, I found a lot more of that than that. And I'm just going to share some of those illustrations uh, with you. This is Nochpiwara, the, the one they are afraid of by Zeno Schindler in 1868. Uh, he is actually listed as a full-blood Missouri. These are silhouettes, uh, possibly the very first Missouri is to visit Washington, D.C., done by Charles Wilson Peel in 1806. Uh, National Anthropological Archives identifies them as Missouri's question mark. So, the, you know, even record keeping wasn't real good in Washington at that time, but they're possibly um, Missouri's. 
Uh, this one from 1819 by Samuel Seymour shows Indian agent Benjamin O'Fallon meeting with the Oto, Missouri and Iowa at Council Bluffs, not Nebraska, this is Council Bluffs, Iowa, on October, uh, in October of 1819. The interesting thing is O'Fallon was the nephew of William Clark, who was superintendent of Indian Affairs. Uh, and he appointed his nephew as Indian agent. Well, Benjamin O'Fallon didn't like Indians, so that was kind of a train wreck having him as a, uh, an Indian agent because he generally wasn't too, too subtle or um, uh, forgiving of them. But uh, during this conference, O'Fallon refused to allow any of the Missouri chiefs to speak he, re, he passed out medals to the Otos and the Iowas. He refused to give any to the Missouri chiefs. His idea, <coughs> excuse me, his idea was to force the complete amalgamation of the Oto and Missouri and just eliminate the Missouri as a people altogether and make them into Otos. It didn't work. Uh, this fellow is called Blind Missouri. Uh, the uh, artist is unknown. I believe it's Charles Bird King, about 1825. It's in the Gilcrease Museum. I found several historical references to Blind Missouri, and he was the chief of the Missouri group that lived with the Little Osage. And I found records from 1833 where Blind Missouri is speaking on behalf of the Missourians that live with the Osage. So, uh, you know, they're still around, they're, they're still active within their host tribes, as I said, and that meant that they still had some presence in Missouri. They weren't entirely gone from the state. And you notice here, he has on the, uh, sacred uh, ivory bill woodpecker mandibles on his headdress. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, this is a, an interesting photo from 1868. This is Oklahoma, buck elk walking and Ian Bricktoe, blackbird. And I'm not so interested in him because he's showing more European acculturation, but uh, Oklahoma is identified in the photograph as a full-blood Missouri, and he has tattoos on his body. And it was very common custom uh, for a lot of tribes in the Midwest and the Plains and even the South to tattoo their bodies. And this, in this illustration, he has body tattoos. And actually the uh, uh, decor, the things that he is wearing are very similar to the things that have been excavated from Missouri sites in Missouri. So if you took that uh, 1851 Colt Navy revolver out of his hand, he could have been posing uh, right here in Saline County, Missouri in, in 1768 instead of 1868. And this is Oklahoma who got the American name Franco English in 1913. He was still around. Now, one of the things I found when I did the research of the records was that everybody said the last full blood Missouri died in 1908. Well, here I just found a picture of Frank English, Oklahoma, in 1913. He's not dead. Uh, here's another. Uh, Missouri Chief, Humathiwi, Black Elk by Zeno Schindler in 1868. Uh, notice he's wearing a grizzly bear claw necklace. <coughs> Excuse me, wearing an otter uh, skin turban. And he's holding uh, a sacred pipe. Not a lot of information about him. Wish I had more. Uh, more pictures. Butcher's Knife, who is the oldest Missouri live in 1896. Again, a grizzly bear claw necklace, lots of beads, pipe tomahawk, and again, the otter skin bandeau. 
Thrache True Eagle, also wearing a grizzly bear claw necklace. Here he has a gorget. It's probably made out of mussel shell, which is symbolic of the sun. And mussels live a tremendously long time. So they're also a symbol of uh, living a, a long, full life as well as uh, reflecting the sun, the giver of life. And this is what Thukarashi eats his food raw, also known as pipe stem. I am friends with some of his descendants. And this is Ella and Julia pipe stem in 1904. And this photo demonstrates the kind of acculturation that has taken place in Odo, Missouri society by the turn of the century. And this is ha Hachiki Suga, he who kills the Osages. And I asked one of my uh, uh, Oto, Oto friends, Sonny Whittlecrow, who, who's uh, semi-fluent in the language. I asked him one time, I said, do you know what this name means? And he says, oh, it's got something to do with uh, uh, fighting or striking Osages. So George Catlin actually got that right. George Catlin was pretty atrocious in transcribing names. And this picture is painted about 1832. And again, you see the otter turban, the grizzly bear claw necklace, and this pipe has a carved bear in it. Uh, Hachiki Suga was probably a member of the bear clan. And in order to wear that bear claw necklace, you had to earn it. Uh, you had to kill the bear uh, using a gun from a distance was cheating. So he would have believed that by killing the grizzly and wearing that necklace, he would assume the power of the bear. And this means he was not a man to be, be trifled with. Uh, the otter bandeau, only certain uh, men were allowed to wear that. It was because an otter is an animal of uh, uh, quick wit, doesn't have any natural enemies, it's adaptable, it can get around on land or water. And so otter bandos among these people was a, a symbol of wisdom, of, of quick wit, and the ability to survive. Now, a cheeky suga, this is probably his son, uh, Sungeka, Richard Whitehorse who was also known as Missouri Chief. Uh, he was born in 1826, and I'm pretty sure this is his father. Uh, he's listed as the son of Ahashika Sawa, which is probably another variation of, of the phonetic spelling of Hashiki Suga. And anyway, he was the, the last hereditary chief of the Oto uh, Missouri. And I actually knew his great great granddaughter. Uh, this is his nephew, Soji Inga, Little Smoke, or Charles Washington Daly. And when Charles was uh, six years old, he accompanied uh, the very last tribal bison hunt out in far western Kansas in 1876, which, by the way, was a successful hunt. Uh, this is George Washington Daly, his brother, also a nephew of Richard Whitehorse, uh, Shrazagi, Old Eagle, 1899, and I always apologize. I can, I, I don't speak the language, so sometimes I mispronounce uh, the names. Um, but I met, again, I know his granddaughter, and um, this is him, and I showed her this photo, and she says, oh, that's rock. She says, Grandpa used to take me riding on rock. And uh, anyway, from George Washington Daly, a lot of the information and things that we know about Missouri culture came from things that George Washington Daly uh, talked about. He, he was one of the last people that really uh, knew quite a bit about the old Missouri culture uh, before it was merged more into Odo culture. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is George's son, Truman Daly, Mashi Manye, Soaring High of the Missouri Eagle Clan. He was also called Sungeka, a white horse, after his grandfather. 
Uh, and this is him in Red Rock, Oklahoma, age 10. Uh, in 1959, he, uh, and for about 10 or years, he was Chief Whitehorse at Frontierland in Disneyland. And people thought that, uh, well, wasn't that kind of uh, demeaning or whatever to have worked at Disneyland and interacted with tourists? And he said, oh no. He said, uh, actually, he said that was a good outreach because he said, think about what was on TV at that time. So that every, every Saturday movies, you know, cowboys were killing evil Indians and, and you had Davy Crockett fighting with Indians on the TV series. And he says, it gave us a chance to show people what we were really like, that we were not like what we were depicted on in TV and movies. So anyway, you know, frontier land's been, been shut down and it was considered insensitive, but I find it interesting that, that a full blood Native American had a very different view of it at the time than, than what some people have now. And uh, Truman was also the treasurer of the Oto Missouri tribe, held a lot of various tribal offices, uh, helped the uh, uh, University of Missouri with the Chiwari language preservation uh, project. And I met him once very, very briefly before he passed away. Uh, this is Dr. Aaron Gahiga. Uh, he was a spiritual leader and the last semi-fluent speaker of the Missouri dialect. And he passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. He told me his father, who Raymond Gahiga here in 1981, was the last full-blood Missouri and the pipe carrier of the Missouri and that his dad had a pipe that was probably over 300 years old that had been passed down um, through the tribe. And Dr. Gahiga does have descendants, but, uh, uh, you know, obviously they're more uh, mixed heritage uh, rather than, than full Missouri is. But like uh, uh, Sonny Little Crow told me, he said, really, he said, you think about it. He said, he said the Oto, Missouri, Iowa, the Winnebago's, he said, we were all one people. We all shared the same DNA. We just, we're, we're just political divisions of the same people. And I thought, you know, really that kind of makes sense. Uh, this was a photograph taken in October of 2009. I mentioned earlier that National Park Service archaeological excavation where William Clark said that Missouri Village was. Uh, the Oto Missourias were very interested in that and uh, a busload of their elders uh, came up for a few days and I got to play tour guide to them, which was, which was a, a, a real blessing and a great joy to be with them and to hear them tell stories and say things what they think uh, uh, about history and what's gone on. And they wanted to take a cedar tree back from this site to Oklahoma uh, because it had spiritual significance to them. And I took a couple of, of the ladies and I drove around and by golly, I found one lone little cedar tree <laughs> in a field that I could dig up that they could take back with them. And here is Missouri's American Indian Cultural Center at Annie and Abel Van Meter State Park, Miami. There are exhibits in there about the Oneota, about the Missourias, and also about the nine tribes that were in Missouri at, at the time of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And the Missourias, Oto, Missouri are still with us uh, uh, today, um, they, their tribal headquarters is in Red Rock, Oklahoma. There's about 3,000 members of uh, the tribe now, and uh, these are the, their surviving clans, the pigeon clan, which is actually the passenger pigeon, the owl, the elk, the buffalo, the beaver, the eagle, and the bear. Uh, two other clans, uh, the wolf and the uh, uh, snake clans, 
have, have gone extinct. But uh, the other Missourians are still with us. They're very uh, vibrant people. They're making uh, strong efforts to uh, recover and preserve their language and pass it on uh, to their young people. And uh, they still have uh, quite a number of uh, traditional ceremonies that they, they practice. So that kind of wraps that up uh, for us now. So I'm supposed to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen if you are watching on YouTube and use the chat box. I will answer at the end. I'm reading that if you couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, um, I this is Steve off screen here, and I've got a bunch of questions. Oh boy! So I think I'm just going to go ahead and ask them, and if you wouldn't mind, kind okay. of repeating the question before you. All answer, right. In case people can't hear too well, um, there's quite a few questions about grizzly bears. So you know, people were basically wondering, um, were were the folks that had had bear necklaces. Mm -hmm. Were they traveling west to find grizzly bears, or were they trading with other tribes? Okay. the the question The question is about grizzly bears. Where where they got the grizzly bear claws? Um, they actually traveled west to hunt grizzlies, and a lot of people don't know this, but uh, the the plains grizzly uh, they ranged probably to the middle of Kansas and Nebraska and maybe as close as the uh, two thirds of both of those states. So they didn't have to go very far to look for them. And, you know, and that just lets you know that at one time you could set out from Missouri and maybe go a couple hundred miles into Kansas and you might start get into grizzly bear territory. Um, so as I mentioned, they did have to uh, kill the bear. Uh, to get the claws, and it would have been a, a very uh, a symbolic ritual thing where they would have apologized to the, the, the spirit of the bear and, you know, showed the animal gra a great deal of respect. Um, some of those necklaces, of course, obviously, as time went on, they were, they were passed down in families, um, you know, especially as bears were hunted out of areas and so forth. And uh, so they were passed down and some, some of the people wore them, but in the, in the early days, the old days, you had to uh, uh, have a certain amount of honors before you were allowed to wear it because wearing a bear claw what necklace was tantamount to wearing a war honor, you know, and it just was something that somebody couldn't go pick up and put on and then parade around on. You get in trouble for that. It was very interesting to see the painting of the man with um, the, uh, I think it was a Catlin painting of. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. So he had the grizzly bear necklace and mm -hmm. then there's a photograph of someone and, and that one looks almost the same. Um, well, they. A few years later. Yeah. Quite a few years later. Obviously. Yeah. They were very, uh, you know, there's a great deal of similarity in how they put these, these things together. And here's the thing too, it's possible in some of these uh, photo studios from the 1860s, 70s and 90s, it's possible that the bear claw necklace could have been passed around in those pictures. Uh, I kind of tend to think this one, this is, this is his own, uh, the, real, the real deal. Uh, this case here, butcher knife, this is probably passed down because, you know, uh, grizzly bears in there, that part of the range probably was pretty well gone by the 1830s or 40s. And Jody Whittier was also wondering, you know, it seems like the number of claws on a necklace are more than one bear would have. So it would have been, kind of, uh, let's see, getting, getting more than one. Or? Very, very pop, pro well, probably, yeah, if there's more than, uh, more than one, <laughs> you know, they would have got them off of all the, the front feet and the back feet. So they would have gotten, what, 20 claws. So one of our questions, I think, is coming from Oaxaca, Mexico. Oh, boy. I'm not sure, but David Bray was wondering, 
where are these buffalo jumps in north central Missouri? Are uh, okay. Are they sort of recorded or even? Yeah, they're they're recorded. I'm trying to think of the name of the archaeologist that I know that did it. That's this thing about getting older, you start forgetting this, this stuff. Bruce McMillan, Bruce McMillan, uh, University of Missouri archaeologist. He's retired now. And um, he told me about these. He said there's about 20 jumps that they've identified throughout central and, and north Missouri. And uh, I don't know specifically where they are. I haven't been to them, but he said they're there. And I said, you mean jumps like the one in Montana? He says, yeah, not as big, but same thing. They were hunting bison the same way here on foot that they were uh, out west where, you know, some of those really spectacular jumps were. And they, he said that the uh, uh, points that they found with it were on out of points. So this was happening anywhere from, uh, uh, the uh, mid 1600s to around 1300 when they were jumping them there. So I found that very uh, interesting and they are recorded, but generally speaking, a lot of these archeological sites, they will not give you the details of where it is because people go out and loot them. Right. And, um, uh, so I just know generally that they exist. Um, I'm not exactly sure what this question means, but we can piece it together. Um, okay. Well, but Jillian Hunt was was wondering, are the records that um, that people have of of the Missouri uh, in the 15th and 17th century mostly geographical? And and I I think you know she's referring to the maps, you know, all the maps that you had. Whereas the most historical, like the written records and the pictures, those mostly begin in sort of the later years of the 18th century. The uh, uh, most of the records are French and and Spanish, and uh, very few of those. There's there's. Reams, I understand there's reams of stuff in uh, in France and Spain that nobody has gone through. And just bits and pieces of this. Of course, there were a lot of, and I didn't lead into the question, but um, a lot of records were evidently lost. I, mean, I know that when Bergmont Bergmont lived with the Missouri as he had this Missouri wife and uh, you know he spent a good deal of time out here and he recorded a lot of stuff he was an educated man whereas a good number of the Frenchmen who were running around out here in the American frontier were illiterate as all get out and Bergmont wrote a lot of stuff down and um, uh, Governor Benville that he reported to wrote lots of stuff down. Well, they went back to France in uh, 1725 and Bergmont took his wife, his son, a uh, Missouri chief, an Illinois chief, and an Osage chief with him. Uh, they were going to meet the king and all this. Well, the ship they were on was the, the Bellarone and out, off of Daphne Island, uh, Alabama, the ship sunk. And all of uh, Bergmont's records, all of Bienville's records down in the drink. Uh, the Indians were embarrassed because when they were in France, uh, they were given all kinds of gifts and they didn't have any gifts to give in return because all their gifts went down with the ship. So a lot of stuff's been lost by fires and, and uh, uh, you know, I'm convinced that, that if I had money and people who could translate, and I went and spent time in uh, uh, Seville uh, or the or, uh, some of the libraries in Paris so we could find, maybe find more information 
uh, than we got. A lot of American researchers have not really tapped Spanish or French archives mm. over here. There's been a very few handful that have done that. Um, this is kind of maybe my own question, uh, but there, there were a couple of questions about cat a night and what that is, mm -hmm. and, and that they sort of got answered. Um, but uh, I was kind of wondering, like, um, how, I mean, we hear of catlinite or pipestone coming from Minnesota mm -hmm. and, and also from Illinois near Cahokia. Um, was it common around here? Or was it pretty limited in the places that you could actually get it? The, the places you could actually get it were very limited. The, the main source was pipestone quarries in Southwest Minnesota. There, there were a couple other places where there were some small deposits, but that's the main place. And of course, that's now a national monument. And the only people that are allowed to go there and dig out pipestone have to be a member of a certified federal tribe. Um, you know, I could not just go out there and pick up a piece of cat one night and walk off with it. That, that'd be a big no-no. Uh, we know that cat one night pipes started showing up around the continent about 3,000 years ago. So the cat one night pipes, uh, some people were going and getting the catlinite, make them into pipes, probably Mississippians, you know, the pipes, bowls, other things. And this stuff was getting traded all around the continent. And of course, catlinite, when it's first dug up, it's kind of soft, kind of, uh, kind of like a soapstone kind of a thing. And it's easy to work. And then once it's been exposed to air, it hardens up. And it has that rusty reddish uh, patina. So it, it just, it just appealed. It worked for ceremonials and uh, it became very, very widespread. So you could find uh, pipes maybe manufactured in Cahokia off down in uh, Oklahoma or someplace else. <coughs> um, Excuse me. Let's see. <clears throat> so Mike, in the mural, um, from Van Meter State Park mm -hmm. that shows the, uh, the, I think the Utz Village or U Utz Village. Utz Village, thank you. Um, <coughs> you know, there is, there's no trees to be found. And there's this, yes. um, you know, this uh, quote that you have that says the only thing that, that the Missouri would burn was buffalo dung. And of course, we know this area now has, a lot, has quite a lot of trees. There's certainly prairies mm -hmm. and Saline County, but um, there was a question um, if you know they did regular burns to manage that prairie in northern Missouri or even yeah, I, by the Missouri River. Okay, the question was about prairies and, and prairie burns, and that's abs absolutely correct. Most of north Missouri and western Missouri, including uh, this part of Saline County, was prairie. Uh, you, you, uh, soil testing demonstrates that it, that it historically was, uh, prairie and the, all the timber that we have now in this area, this is growing up because we removed fire. We removed the big grazing animals, the bison and the elk that kept, uh, woody brush knocked down. So yeah, you go to man meter today and you can't have this view that you have here because it's all woods around there. It's all woods around the, the structure of the old fort, all woods ringing around uh, the, the village area. Now they're restoring prairie up there, but for a long time, it, it, was, it was gone. And it's like Saline County. Saline County, about 75% of Saline County was historically uh, prairie. And, and now we've got 80 acres of it restored at Van Meter, and I'm going to have about 40 acres restored here shortly. Uh, so yeah, it, it very the, the landscape was very different. Uh, the Indians we know set fires, and setting fires did a couple of things. It uh, it could drive game towards hunters. 
but also setting fire regenerated the prairie. And when all that new grass came up, that was attractive to, to bison and uh, uh, browsing animals. So, you know, by, by setting fires, uh, that I, I believe the Missouri is, I believe other Indians and, and were, were actually managing their pasture lands for their cattle. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, Mike, there's still quite a few questions left. Um, we probably won't hit them all, but okay. um, Philip Newell um, is on YouTube and he was asking, um, and I kind of missed this, but I guess you were talking about a vermilion powder and he was wondering if that vermilion powder was um, cinnabar or the ore that we get mercury from or if you yeah. knew. Yeah, yeah, vermilion, vermilion called, called cinn cinnabar. Um, Another another source for it was uh, uh, let's see was a uh, not pyrite. Now the name of it escapes me. I'm trying to remember mm -hmm. now, but but yeah, that was that was one of it. Yeah, this uh, uh, a lot of these paints that were traded were not healthy for mm. you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, cause they had lead bases in them and mercury and so forth like that. But, uh, part of what made it stick. Yep. What made it stick. Uh, David Owens is wondering, um, what the age distribution of the contemporary Missouri are now. Um, that's a tough question. Cause it, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the, what the median what the median age is now a, a lot of the older people i mean i hate it because it's, it seems like every week or or two i hear somebody one of the elders uh dying uh a lot uh, and I understand a lot of the members are mixed heritage they're they're intermarried with uh other tribes uh, because, you know, when, when you lot had as much of a population drop as they did, it was hard to find somebody to marry that you were not related to. So there was a lot of intermarriage with uh, neighboring tribes. Um, there are a lot of intermarriage with whites, Hispanics, uh, you know, some with, some with African-Americans too uh, but uh, the, the Odom Missouri and, and, and most of the, of the tribes as well they have a standard for determining who's going to be called a member of the, the tribe and so they uh, uh, you know not anybody that says I have ancestry can just uh, belong they have to be able to demonstrate how they're related uh, through family and and they were patrilineal society uh, everything was counted through the father's uh, lineage so like you were born in, into your, your father's clan not your mom's clan now for other tribes like the cherokees and the iroquois it's just the opposite it's uh you know your clan comes from your mom but out here it was different with the suan people um Amy Meyer was wondering, would any of, of the Missouri items um, or, or people have been transported in some of the steamboats, like the ones that have been stranded nearby, like the Malta, the Malta um, or the Arabia that have been dug up? Oh, sure. Um, there were Indian delegations all the time that were going to Washington, uh, D.C. or to St. Louis to meet with William Clark. And, uh, uh, you know, they would have ridden on steamboats. Uh, I know some of the four steamboats were going down in canoes and so forth. Uh, I found a record from 1855 of a group of Odo, Missouri, and uh, Omaha Indians on their way to Washington, D.C., actually stopping in Arrow Rock and spending the night in the tavern. Um, so, yeah, they, they uh, Indian agents would have gathered them up from time to time, and they would have ridden steamboats to and from 
St. Louis, keel boats or canoes, whatever was available. Uh, this is a really great question, and, and it might be the last one, but okay. as soon as I say that, um, we'll, we'll get another good one. But Betsy Garrett, who asked the question before about um, burning on the prairies, she was wondering, with so much prairie, where did they find all these ivory-billed woodpeckers? Well, you got to understand, uh, she wanted to know about where did they find ivory-billed woodpeckers uh, with all the prairie. You got to understand that that the bottomlands were dense forest. A um, lot of swamps, lots of wetlands, lots of wet prairie, uh, just lots of stands of sycamore and uh, cottonwoods. And um, we cannot appreciate the size of those trees that existed back then because I don't really think any exist anymore. I've seen a couple of stumps of um, sycamore and cottonwoods uh, that stood at one time. And I mean, they were massive. They would dwarf anything that we saw today. And you have to think back in that time period, there would have been whole stands of those bottomland trees that just would, would have dwarfed anything that we see today by, by almost twice. So, you know, basically I rebuild were bottomland woodpecker. And there were plenty of trees in the bottomlands for them to uh, make nests in and so forth and so on. Well, of course, all those got cut down and cleared out for agriculture and steamboat fuel and so forth and so on. So. Right. Um, I, I, I had heard from someone and I think it was speculation that you know, in the Brunswick area, which now is <clears throat> or near Dalton, mm -hmm. you know, there's quite a big pecan thing going on up there. Mm -hmm. and, um, I've, I had heard speculation that maybe the uh, uh, Missouri had actually planted some of the original pecans in that area. And maybe they had been traded up from further south because there seems to be about as far north as it naturally yeah. are. But um, is that something that you've ever heard of? Uh, pecan trees, it seems like, um, seems like somewhere I have read that, that they actually do think they were more of a southern tree and that they uh, probably did get transplanted up here at a later date through, through trade and so forth. But, you know, and I'm not an arborist, but, but somehow or another they figured out looked at some of the genetics of it. And I think they calculated that actually uh, like more down towards the boot hill and on south and the Delta was prime pecan country. And then it, they got traded up here at a later date and planted planted by Indians up here. So yeah, I suppose it so could. Could very well be mm -hmm. um, Oneyata or- Yeah, Oneyata or uh, Mississippians. Uh, uh, same people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the same, more or less. Uh, um, I'm going to take a peek here. And, uh, okay, so I will say that um, David Gray, who's our, our friend down in Mexico, he he did Google and find the article by Bruce McMillan oh, about yeah. the bison jumps in. Unfortunately, he, uh, the link he sent, I can't really access it, so... I'll email him and uh, we'll get that link and share that too. I actually, I've got the paper got online. The paper. Yeah. <laughs> read it already. Um, cool. Well, yeah. then, uh, okay. And then here's the last one. I think Kevin, uh, Kevin is asking, how did we know they were ivory bill as opposed to pileated woodpeckers? Um, especially, I imagine the drawings. Now. Um, uh, it could, it could, there could be pileated with them as yeah. well. Uh, one of the things, though, is just the sheer size of them, because the ones I saw in the Osage Tribal Museum, they they're they're huge, and they could only be ivory bill. Right. Uh, but they very well, I think, could have used pileated as well. Uh, but just some of the the ones that I've seen in the Osage collection, that's all they could be, because they are just monsters. 
Well, there's a lot of people really thanking you for okay. um, your time and all the amazing um, research and, and great images that you're able to share with us. Um, and uh, Dennis Hankamp said that he visited Van Meter State Park in 2016. And he really wished he would have seen your presentation before your visit. So it just sort of brings up that, mm -hmm. um, you know, Van Meter State Park is, you know, it's right in mid-Missouri and um, it's not all that far from I-70. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a super great resource. Um, I don't know if it's open yet, but. Uh, uh, yeah, they've been open. They're, they're, they're on limited hours. Of course, they don't have that one. They don't have a very large staff up right. there. So they're a better time to visit Van Meter is is on the weekends. Um, I think it's Monday and Tuesday that they're they're closed. And, it's, and again, it's just they don't have a lot of staff up there, so sure. they can't stay open all the time. Um, so, well, uh, Mike, thank you so all much. All right, you're and, welcome. Um, you thank know, you everybody for the good questions and and. Uh, you know, if I gave any wrong answers or wrong information, I apologize. I'm always learning uh, new stuff. And occasionally somebody comes out of the woodwork and says, you got this wrong. And I go, well, by golly, I did. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Good night to everybody. Good night.